We welcome you this morning to the first service of uh, New Life, and um, we are into what we call two services, uh, either, I know we say the pandemic pushed us into it, but I'd rather say the Lord led us into it. And um, we welcome you here, we welcome you online, and uh, as we uh, endeavor to see where we are in this book, see what spiritually, what time it is, and, and what's going on. In this, we're looking at the book of Daniel and what the Lord's saying to the churches uh, in this awesome time and awesome opportunity that we have. Uh, we'll begin, if you will, I want to use the scriptures today, so if you got your Bibles, you want to turn to the book of Daniel, or if you've got your iPad or your cell phone or whatever you might have, to so turn to the uh, book of Daniel. Those of you that are online, we really are glad that you're with us. We don't take it lightly and for granted, and I know we're not supposed to look at numbers, but we do look to see how many is watching online. You've got to understand we need to know if we need to do it or not. <laughs> so if you're watching online, it, let, it gives us an idea of, of, uh, of what's going on out there. Also, uh, I'm Alan Smith, and I'm doing the first service, our pastor, uh, Steve Watson, will be with us at the second service. As we begin in the book of uh, Daniel this morning, you... I will be picking up where I left off last week, and so if you, you might want to look uh, at last week's, if there's not anything you're understanding about uh, this week's. The book of Daniel is so revelatory in the days that we're living in. Um, there is a, the prophecies that are being fulfilled. Uh, the nation Israel is now in their homeland. The deserts are flourishing, and now with fruit, there's just all kinds of, uh, there's water uh, now in the deserts. There's all kinds of, of Bible prophecy that's being fulfilled that, can, that comes out of the book of Daniel that we're seeing happening now. So we know that this is a now word, a now book. Uh, for us to see where we are. I know there's a lot of different opinions out there of where we are. I, we even have our own opinions that are not even biblical, but they're still our opinions. And it's in light of these things that uh, we're looking for truth. But the Word of the Lord is, is the only truth that we have. And it was spoken way before we were born. So I'm sure that we can trust it. As we're, I'm going to ask you then, I'd like to do a few questions. I'm sure you recognize that house very well. Tell you the truth, that is the back of the house. Let me give you the front of the house. Now I'm sure perhaps that will help. Uh, I've been speaking last week about Reese Howe, and this is actually the college of Reese Howes, and it's the Bible College of Wales. This is, uh, that is when it was beginning, well, it wasn't total disarray there. There were some pictures worse, but, uh, and I mentioned last week that uh, some uh, people from, uh, what country was it? Singapore. Singapore, Singapore. Uh, there was a church in Singapore, uh, went, bought the property, and now is restoring it. The co Bible college is now back open. It's just a small college. Uh, but this is where Reese, uh, how he started it. And it's where a lot of the prayer during World War II uh, came from, was from this little, little college. And uh, this is, now if you look in this first picture, see our second picture to the right, you see that little white thing out front? Uh, this is what it looks like cleaned up. And so it shows you when they went in there, they were cleaning up the grounds and uh, cleaning up this uh, 
place of prayer. Now, the point being, if you were in warfare, would you not want your most prized possession or your, your, your ground zero or mission control, if you will, would you not want it hidden? Hidden from the enemy? <clears throat> That's the way God does intercession. It's hidden. It has a hiddenness in which it delivers its message. So, but here this little church uh, uh, bought it. The, it was in, it, the Bible college was shut down. It was in disarray. They came in. The Lord gave them the commissioning to, to reestablish this little Bible college. And that's what the front entrance looks like. Now, there's other dorms and different things on throughout. But this was the first uh, and the main uh, the main. Uh, Bible part of the Bible college here. Now, inside the Bible college, this is a room that has been restored, but it's also for this particular photo. It was, it was um, different furniture and things were brought back in for this photo, but this was a special room in that Bible college, a very special room, and it was called the Blue Room. When Reese Howe said, okay, we must go to the Blue Room, Mission Control. This is where the, the, when the Holy Spirit called for travailing prayer to get the job done prayer. They would be praying at different places, but then he would say, Blue Room, it's time for the Blue Room. And they would pray here until he would say, it's finished. It's done in the heavenlies. We can now go home. And then they would read about the accomplishments two or three days later in the paper. But they knew it was done in the heavenlies. They were so assured. They were such a people of prayer. They were so in touch. And so that lets me know a truth. I cannot gauge the reality of spiritual prayer by my personal prayer life. I've got more work to do, y'all. <laughs> I'm not there yet. But I know I've got somewhere to go. So I cannot base the reality of true moving prayer based on my personal experience. Now, I've experienced what I have experienced, but I haven't experienced that. Uh, look here, what, this is one thing they prayed for, praying for the nation of Israel. 1938, the college began to pray for the Jews of Europe, especially uh, that God would allow them to return to their ancestral land. This became a repeated prayer theme up to and included the historic 1947 United Nations decree that reestablished the nation of Israel. There's no doubt in my mind that they had a major part in it. They started praying for it uh, uh, in 38. And it was something that this was one of their regular things of prayer. Because Reese knew that when this happened, that the other things engaged. When the Jews were back in their homeland, all of a sudden prophetically. See, they were praying one specific prayer, but he knew it engaged the book. <laughs> you see. So it's kind of like he knew where the trigger was. And he started praying for the trigger. And sure enough, it triggered. It happened. And then we had World War II and all the like during this time of Hitler and the Jews that were, I mean, look at, let's look at the scene that went on during this time. But understand that the prayer was the issue. Now, I want us to see this in the book of Daniel because Daniel was a man of prayer. Now, the book of Daniel, is, as I've said, is the story of four kings and a man who prayed. So the key to Daniel is here in Daniel 6, 10. Daniel always prayed to God. Look at that. Three times every day. Three times every day he bowed down on his knees to pray and praise God. Even though Daniel heard about the new law that Nebuchadnezzar had made, he still went to his house to pray. He went up to the upper room of his house and opened the windows that faced towards Jerusalem. Then Daniel bowed down on his knees and prayed just as he always had done. You see that? Just as he always had done. So the emphasis of the book of Daniel, which is overlooked so many times, is prayer. This is where it took place. What we read about in the book of Daniel was taken care of in prayer before it happened. You know, Daniel did get a lot of revelations. They're not all written down, trust me. So now let's look as we move forward. Now in Daniel chapter 3, and I've got a lot of information to cover, so I will move fairly quickly. 
To start with in chapter 3, you understand we covered the golden image. The second part of chapter 3 is the fiery furnace. Now, in building an image we covered last week, just as a little uh, highlight, building an image was in Daniel 3. We went over how we build our own images. What is our image to be like? We saw what's in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to teach them who are called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow, He also did, did predestinate to be conformed to what? the image of His Son, that He might be firstborn among many brethren. So we know that our own ego, that our own sin, we know that the enemy wants us to focus on our own image, create our own image. It's the battle of the soul. It's the battle of the Spirit. So our image is to be like the Son of God. Now when you do not build your own image, the kingdom of God will thrive in your life. Let's move quickly. Now, as I covered last week, and to bring it back into the scope of what we're covering this week, we had two men but one vision. We had who? Reese Howes. Then we had Reinhard Bonnke. Two men, one vision. Same as with Daniel as we move forward. Now in chapter 3 we have the golden image. Now we're moving into the fiery furnace, furnace the last part of Daniel 3. <clears throat> and it will start in verse 8. If you'll turn there in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. And you're at verse 8 and we'll begin. It says, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalmsery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth down, not down, and worship that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So here we find is called the three Hebrew children here, that they are not worshiping this golden image that Nebuchadnezzar built of himself. Now, as they are accused of this crime, the question is, where is Daniel? If you look back at verse 49 of chapter 2, and we will see where Daniel is. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he said, Who? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. But Daniel sat at the gate of the king. So here we got the king. So Daniel was sitting, he was with the king. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was put over, overseeing uh, the job that Daniel once had. But Daniel was moved up. He sat with the king. So as they were brought before the king, what you've got to understand, Daniel was probably there too. He was probably there. So here we got the number two guys, if you will, of Daniel. King sitting here. Daniel probably sitting here. And they're brought forth and they're sitting in, in, in the king and they're accused by their accusers to the king that they did not bow down. So now, what's going on? Why is this uh, set up like this? Where was Daniel? He was with the king. Now, here we got Reese. How? Will you step up when your leader is not there? That was what was going on. All of a sudden, their leader wasn't there. They were now on their own. And the question was, would they step up? As we know, we now know that Reinhard Bonnke did step up. 
Reese was not there. He did step up. Does anybody know the picture of this man? Who that is? Bob Jones. Bob Jones has been here quite a few times, actually, and prophesied the room upstairs, prophesied that there's a healing portal right in this area. You want to know why we say it? Because Bob said it. You say, well, Alan, do you believe Bob? Well, I say, well, I'll put you this way. I know you're not supposed to bet in church, but I'm a farmer. I bet every year I plant corn. Being a betting man as I am, I put my $100 bill on Bob Jones. He said that there's a portal there, then I'm going with it. So here we got a man named Bob Jones, and I don't know, as I was with Bob, he, he, he used to pray for people, and he said, he'd say, uh, you want to go up? Anybody remember that? You remember that? You want to go up? And everybody's standing there thinking, what is he, what is he talking about? You want to go up? And then uh, I've seen him do it over and over and over. And, of course, when Bob said, he said, well, I'll pray for you. Well, people just don't run. And you think people would run jump for Bob to pray for him. You're a little easy, especially when he says you won't go up. <laughs> when you ain't ever been up. So I've seen it happen. And so people would come. They'd kind of get within 10 feet of him. You know, they kind of did the six-foot thing. And uh, so they'd kind of, kind of come around. By, and Bob said, "No, you got, you got to come on up here." I've seen him do it over and over, and I think he's scared to death, you know. And he said, "No, you got to step up here. Come on, you got to come up here." So they'd come, and he'd pray, and he'd say, "Okay, you're going up, you're going up." He'd say, "Okay, you're there, you're there." And I'm like, I don't, "I'm not sure if I know they're there. If they're, I don't know what's going on here." So God called it going up. I've talked to him several times, and and I'd say, and because he he spent more time on you stepping up there to him than he did on the going up, and I, it always now I, he never said it like this, but I condensed what I learned from Bob watching him do that so many times, and if I were to condense it, I'm going to say it like this: you must step up to go up. <laughs> <laughs> you, as Bob would say, did you get it? No, he'd say, did you get her? Did you get her? Because he would say, and I'd ask Bob, he said, he would say, he said to Alan, the most important part is that they'll come up. Well, what, what's the deal? And so I finally started to get it. You got to step up before you're going to go up. That's what happened here with the three Hebrew children. They had to step up to the occasion. Now we're all in these battles and we're all in these fires and most of us are getting burnt, our hinder parts are getting burnt because we're running from all these fires. Instead of facing the fire and stepping up to the challenge of what's set before us. And if we want to bring the supernaturalness of God into a fiery trial, you've got to step up to it before you're going to go up to it. This is what we learn with this, the three Hebrew children. Now let's watch it as it plays out. Now Daniel chapter 3, uh, uh, let's turn to your Bibles there right quickly. Chapter uh, 3 verse 13. Now this is what I call the promotion time for the Hebrew children. If you're going to uh, step up to go up, that's what you call a promotion. And when you're fighting the battle of stepping up, you're fighting the greatest, the greatest battle, and I've said this to several before, your greatest battle you'll ever fight with the enemy is your last one. Then all of a sudden, but then I had the other one say to me, well, Alan, I thought the last one was the last one. <laughs> I said, yeah, it, it was the last one one time. <laughs> Point being, the enemy keeps up in the ante to the battle. So look at it here in verse 13. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, It is true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now, if ye be ready, <clears throat> that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sacket, psalmstry, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. But if ye uh, worship not, ye shall be cast that same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. You see that? <clears throat> he says, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from burning from this burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What they were saying, if he doesn't and we are burnt up, who cares? That's what he was saying. Who cares? At least we're going to be delivered from you. Now, that was their time of promotion. It was their time to have a supernatural experience with God. The fiery furnace, the fire, the challenge is the opportunity to step up, to go up, into the supernatural presence of God. Now, there's something I want you to see here. Are you flammable or fireproof? <laughs> now, I want to I want to I want to show you something here. We're going to look in the scriptures, not just at it. We're going to look in it. Are you flammable or fireproof? I want to read you a little. Uh, I've, I think I put it right there. You see that, Ryan Hardbonke? Here's the book. Are we flammable or fireproof? I, if you want to, I encourage you to go to Amazon and order that book. The elders are reading it now. Uh, are we flammable or fireproof? It talks about Ryan Hardbonke being moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Does this church embrace the power of the Holy Spirit? We do. We've read more about it than we've seen, but I've been assured we're going to see more than we've read. Amen. That's good. Amen. That was a good place to say amen. Here's what Reinhardt said uh, in the preface of this book. I was invited to preach at a Christian meeting where the people did not believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, in the middle of my service, the Holy Spirit, and suddenly in the middle of my service, the Holy Spirit fell, and people were rejoicing, being filled with the Spirit and praising. When I looked at the crowd, right in the middle, there were three or four people who were totally untouched. They had their eyes open and they were looking all around instead of participating in the supernatural event. And then it came to my heart, these people must be Abestos Christians. <laughs> Abestos Christians. Oh, I've never heard that one before. They were fireproof. Even when the fire of the Holy Spirit fell, I want to tell you, I personally am flammable for God. I want to burn with the fire of the Holy Spirit and carry a burning torch right to the end of my life. This experience gave me the title of this book, and I put that question to you today. Are you flammable or fireproof? Now, I want you to consider something here. I want to teach you about two fires. Two different fires. It's the fire within and it's the fire without. It's the battle of the two fires. Here, Reinhard Bonnke in this book is talking about a fire within. Others were fireproof. Well, the Hebrew children weren't fireproof within. They were fireproof without. The ones that Reinhard Bonnke is talking about were fireproof within. 
Can you, hear, can you hear what I'm saying? Two fires, say it with me, two fires. Two fires. One, within one within and one without. Now, I'm giving you a true prophetic understanding here. Now, just go with me. <clears throat> Let's look at it in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19. We'll jump to 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury and form of his vintage, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat, heat the furnace uh, seven times more than it uh, was uh, to be heated. Now listen, the enemy heated the furnace, the fire, seven times hotter. When you're moving with God, the enemy's making your fire without hotter. You're not normal. You're not having the normal fiery trials of mankind. You're having a fire that's been heated seven times. Boy, I didn't get amen out of that one. <laughs> have you even got a witness to what I'm saying? You say, well, why does everybody have it so good? Because the enemy's not stoking their fire. He's stoking your fire. Going to heat this baby up. See if you'll fold. There's two fires, one within, one without. The truth that I'm going to teach you today is the greatest truth you'll ever hear if you'll hear it. Now, other than the cross, lest I be get an email. The fire within kept them from being burned by the fire without. How many times a day did they pray? Probably three. Fire within. Prayer is the wind of the Spirit upon the fire of God within your soul. Yes. You ever heard the term fan the flames? Yeah. We'll move on here. Can anybody describe what that was? Burn up house. Now, there's something in this picture. I'm going to put up another picture. There's something that this picture and the next picture have in common. I want you to tell me what it is. All right, you got, you got that in your mind? Does everybody see the details? All right, second picture. What do they have in common? What? Chimneys. For some reason, the fireplace survived the fire. Something survived the fire. It's the fireplace. It's the fire. It's the, it's the place that's built for the fire. The problem is there was a fire got outside where the fire should be. Nonetheless, the chimney remains. Now let's think about this. There's something still standing in the fire. And I want us to focus on this little chimney here. Let's look into some scripture. It says this in Hebrews 12, 27. And this word yet once more signified the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a what? A consuming fire. Another scripture. 1 Corinthians 3.12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall be declared it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. We cannot escape the fire. That's wrong. Don't feel sorry for little Hebrew children. You've got one too. 
but the fire comes. But there's something that's left standing with the Hebrew children. It's the place of the fire. How can you stand in the fire? Let's watch this right quickly. My, my, I got 10 minutes. I must hurry, and I can't leave you in the fireplace. <laughs> I might go over five minutes, but y'all help me move. How can you stand in the fire? How can that fireplace back there stand? Well, number one, their special brick has a special additive that's in a fireplace. When you've got a fireplace, you build it with house brick on the outside, but inside the firebox is special brick. It is special brick, and it's got something added. Well, if you're going to stand in the fire, you've got to have something added. It's called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what makes you survive the fire. Now, there's another thing here. I want you to see it. There's special mortar, and it has a special additive. So you got this firebox. You got these special brick. They're, they're usually look a white color. You know what I'm saying? It's a different type brick. All bricks made with fire. They're fired brick, but some can handle greater heat. Well, when when a certain brick has been had an additive to it, listen, y'all. Our fires are seven times harder than the world's, but you've got something added that the world doesn't. So they want to watch you burn and survive in your fire. That's the testimony. Well, I don't know if you're all liking this story or not. <laughs> now, let's see what else we got here. Fireplace mortar gets stronger by the fire. Now, isn't that something? That's good. You not ever heard you build a new house, you got to season the fireplace? Oh. How do you season it? You build a smaller fire, you let the heat keep building. It sets the mortar. Because it gets tempered by the heat. You didn't know you got born again to jump in the fire, did you? But you can survive the fire. Surviving the fire is the testimony of the power of God. The Hebrew children experienced the supernatural power of God in the fire. Oh, God, let me experience you. Oh, God, I want to see you move. Okay, jump in the fire. <laughs> Here we go. Let's move on quickly. Now, the fireplace, it may not be pretty, but it's still standing. <laughs> if he, somebody feel my pain. Come on. It might not be pretty, but it's the only thing that's still standing. Come on. Might be pretty, but she's tough. Now, y'all with me? We're going to move on. Now, the Hebrew children, they were staring in the face of their fiery trial. If your fiery trial of life is burning you up, turn up the fire within. Battle of two fires, fire out here. You say, oh, woe is me. No, turn up a fire. God says, come on, come on, somebody. Burn fire. Within, if the fire's hotter within, that's without. You'll quench the without. Here he goes. First John 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have to overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Come on. Anybody read that one before? There you go. They were staring in the face of their fiery trial. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples. I want you all to go with me here. I'm going to show you some examples of the fiery trial. All these outcomes you're maybe not going to like, but I'm still going to tell you the truth. Now, let's look at the truth. I'm going to use as a scenario sickness. That's a trial that we all can identify. There's all kinds of trials, fiery trials, but I'm going to use sickness. Situation A, we can be delivered from the fire such as the Hebrew children. Just be delivered, plumb from the fire. We can be healed, fire's gone. That is a true situation. Our faith is made strong by that fire when people are healed. We get stronger because of that. 
Now, the next one, same fire trial, situation B. We can be delivered through the fire. Right. Now, we don't like to get into this one. Same fire, same situation, just as hot. No different. Delivered through the fire. Same sickness. Says this in John 11, 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. Hallelujah. Well, we don't want this one. But you got to understand, what, they're talk what he's talking about is a fire within. When the fire within is greater than the fire without, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. When you're in sickness and still glorifying God, wherever we are in life, whatever fiery trial it is, we're glorifying God. Come on. Because we know that God is the one that is controlling all these circumstances, and we have given them all over to Him. Yes. Now, the fiery trial will burn the fake out of us. Is anybody interested in this? Or you want me to skip? I can't skip it. We'll take a vote. No, go on, go on. Oh, okay. Here we go. If it ain't you, you can talk about your neighbor. Situation B. We can be delivered through the fire. Here we go again. Faith is refined that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Some of these fiery trials are to burn this fakeness out of us. That we press into God. Listen, let me use flash. We're not staying here forever. Hundred years will get every one of us. New crowd here. And we're all gonna be in glory, not gonna be here. You gonna say, Alan, you remember when you preached and scared us? I'm gonna say, I hope it did. Now, they were staring at the face of their trial. Same fire trial, sickness. I'm gonna go into another scenario here. Situation C. We can be delivered by the fire into his presence. In other words, they said, Hebrew children said, listen, if he takes us out of here or if we die here, who cares? They said, at least we'll be out of your face and in the face of God. Said, doesn't make any difference. We win, 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 win. That's right. It's according to the fire within. See, the enemy's trying to throw water on your fire within so your fire without will consume you. Now, I didn't say your brick wouldn't be scorched. <laughs> I didn't say that. You seen the old chimney. It wasn't pretty, but it made it. If you're trying to get through this one pretty, you might be at the wrong place. Now, situation C, delivered into his presence. We can be delivered by the fire into his presence, says this in Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are encompassed by a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Can anybody see that? There's joy in the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our faith is made perfect. Hebrews 11.2, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. <clears throat> now, here's the reward of perfect faith, as I've got three minutes here. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that what? that love him. We've got to understand the fiery trials of life. I'm sorry to inform you, your fires are probably seven times hotter than the world's. 
But the goal is that the fire of the Holy Spirit will burn within us at a higher flame. A higher flame. I wish we could do it by invitation. But it seems as though in life, God knows we don't have but so much time. So he turn, lets the fires of life turn up so that we will pursue him with the fire of God down in our souls. It says this in Daniel 3, 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will do what? Will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What gods will we bow down to? Now, what keeps the fire burning hotter outside versus within? It's because when we bow down to other gods, that was the issue with the Hebrew children. They did not bow down. And so since they, they had a resolve, they had a commitment, what area in your life do you have unbelief? It is there that false gods will be entertained. You will start to believe that God is not going to come through for you. And you start feeling that, the internal fire of God, the baptism of fire of God in your soul and in your bones must burn so hot that the fire around you doesn't matter. You can say, well, Alan, I'm in pain. You don't understand. The only thing I can tell you by the authority of the Word of God, that the fire of God inside of you can be hotter than the fire of life outside of you. That's right. Come on. What happens when we have a resolve to not bow down? Our circumstances become a servant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's something that takes us up into the third heaven. When we step up to what this word is saying, when you step up, you'll go up. And it's in that gone up situation that you're in a supernatural environment that the presence of God is taking over your circumstance. When we do not bow down, it says yes and amen to our experience and our awesome and supernatural God. Now understand something here. To bow down to a God is the enemy to stepping up to the true God. That's good. Yeah. It's a battle there. It's not that you, we just bow down to a false God. It bowing down to a false god takes the place of stepping up to the one and true God. Can anybody hear what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get into bowing down that we've got going on now in sports and all that, but I could go there if I wanted to. I'll tell you that right now. Being the man of God I am, I'm going to leave it alone. If y'all say amen, leave it alone, Alan. All right, Daniel 3, 22. It says, Therefore... Because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Did y'all see? Did y'all read that? The men that took them up there, it was so hot, God burned up. So I guess the three Hebrew children said, well, they're dead. We just help jump in. <laughs> they were dead before they got them there. And so they just went ahead and fell in. Pretty hot fire, don't you think? Now here's something I want you to see here. The very fact that they made it into the furnace is a miracle. Y'all hear what I'm saying? The very fact that you made it to your fire was a miracle of God. Somebody hear me. The very fact you made it to the fire is a miracle of God. So why are you going to make it through it? Yes. 
Now consider this. There are many miracles that precede a big miracle. <laughs> Come on. Can you hear me? There's many miracles precede a big one. Oh my goodness, I'm out of time. I could go there and I'm going to have to quit. Be careful who you pull until you fire. Now here's my point. You can share all your fire with everybody you want to, but the question is, you're going to pull them into a fire that's not their fire and they're going to burn. That's good, Al. Can anybody hear what I'm saying? Yes. Well, I got to tell this. Well, I got to tell that. Well, I got to tell this. Well, you're pulling them into a fire that they have not been prepared for and it's not for them and they're going to burn up. Yeah. They're not going to make it. My goodness, preacher, I got to quit. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake unto the counselors, Did we not cast three men into the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True. And then he said, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste, spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men into the fire? They answered, Yes. He answered and said, Lo, I see four. Loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is likened to the Son of God. Hey, they stepped up. Their leader wasn't there. They stepped up to the fiery trial, and guess what? They went up. Come on. They went up, and they got the Son of God. He was right there with them in the fire. You want the Son of God in your situation? You step up to it. Own it. Get burned on your face and your front side at least. Don't get your binder parts burned from running away. Come on. Step up and you'll go up. Most Christians are right at the supernatural experience and don't step up to it. Come on. And see the power of God. Here we see it. I'm done. Keep the inner fire hotter than the outer fire. For the inner fire is the fueled, is the fuel empowered by the supernatural kingdom of God. I've got a little more, but I got to quit. Has anybody heard what I tried yes. to say? Yes. Let's stand, if you will, yes. and let's listen to the heart of God as He's calling this church to listen. Where we're headed in the world today. You can either step up to the kingdom or run. run. But I want to tell you something. If you're part of the kingdom of God, your outer fire is going to get, it's, it's already seven times hotter. But when we are in the kingdom of God, the power of God that lives in every one of us in this room. And it wasn't Daniel. It wasn't Daniel that this story is about. It was those, the leader was gone and it was the three Hebrew children, and they are the ones that God made this huge example out of to show how the fire of God within them can burn. It can burn. Let your inside of you burn with the power of the kingdom. It's going to feel like a fire. A baptism of the Holy Ghost or of the Holy Spirit within, it feels hot feels like a fire. I've prayed with people. You can feel it in your hands sometimes. It gets hot. That's the reason you say it's like a fire. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. I thank you for this morning. I ask and pray, Lord Jesus, if there's anything that I've said that's not of you, that it would fall to the ground. But Lord God, if anything that I've said is of you, I pray, oh God, that we, this church, would be just like a chimney in a house fire, that it'll be standing here beside the road because we can endure all the fires of this earth because the fire of the Holy God burns within us. Baptize us is my prayer, oh God. I felt as though you gave me permission if I brought this truth, <coughs> that you gave me permission to call for a baptism of fire upon this congregation and upon this group and this body of believers. So God, I call right now as a testimony of your word for a fire of God, a baptism of fire, a baptism of the Holy Spirit to fall upon all of these 
believers in this house that your kingdom might be glorified and that your testimony might go to the ends of the earth. And all of those that agreed said, yes. amen and amen.